Well, good evening and welcome to our eighth Bible study in the book of Ephesians. And uh, we pick it up in chapter 4 and we're reading verses 1 to 6. As a prisoner of the Lord, then I urge you to live your life worthy of the calling that you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing one another in love, making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as we're called to one hope. And when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is in all and through all. Hallelujah. Amen. What a great set of verses again. Now, let me make something perfectly clear right at the beginning here, is that the Apostle Paul is in lockdown. Uh, majority of the time that he wrote letters and ministered to the body of Christ, he wasn't standing in a pulpit. He was chained in a prison. Whether that was an open prison in somebody's house, he, he was under house arrest, several times, uh, whether it was in the dungeons or the darkest part of the prison. Um, from that place, he ministered grace and peace and joy and imparted giftings to the early church. And so I just want to reinforce something to you this evening is that the kingdom of God is far more bigger, far bigger, far more bigger, that was not very good English, really, far bigger than just the couple of services we have on a Sunday. We have a tendency to believe that our faith is based around our coming to a place of worship. Paul could not go to church, but he was church where he was. And actually, through prayer and, and through continuing to love God and serve God, he saw incredible things happen through his ministry. Now, you would think because he was locked down that he was locked out. But we've learned over this pandemic time, haven't we, that actually God can still do far more for us than we could ever possibly imagine or think, regardless of whether we're in a church building or not and in fact we've learned some really big lessons and I hope that we continue to apply those as time goes by but wherever you are today whether from a prison cell or from a gym or from the driving seat of your car or wherever you find yourself at work college or school God can use you and our prayers change people's lives he prayed for the early church and he prays he prays this and he encourages them to do this I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling that you have received. What he's saying is just don't sit there happy that you're going to heaven. There's a far bigger call upon your life. And I want to say that to everyone that's listening this evening. God has called us all to something in the kingdom of God. We weren't just called uh, to sit. We weren't just saved so we could find that we got a ticket to heaven. God has put a calling upon our lives. He's given us ministries. He's given talents. He's dish out stuff in our lives. We have things in our in our makeup, in our minds, in our hearts, our personalities that God has placed there so that we can be an intrinsic part of his body working alongside him. And so he urges them and he encourages them to get in with the game, you know, not just sit on the outside watching. You know, we're not called to spectators in church. We're supposed to be participators and get on with the job that God has called us to do. So he's urging them from his prison cell, look, do something with the freedom and the liberty that they have. God's called you to something special. Stand up and be counted and make a difference where you are. Bless the Lord. And then he goes on to, to say how that needs to look like and what it needs to feel like. And he says, so be completely humble, gentle and love one another. Mark 10 says this, whoever wants to be great among you must be the servant. Whoever wants to be the first must be a slave of all. Even the Son of Man did not come to serve, but to be served and to give his life a ransom for many. The starting place to servanthood in the kingdom is to serve others. If we want to give birth to that calling, then we start to serve others. You'll never, never, never have this huge thing from God, this huge vision from God, that is yours and you'll be able to jump up and down and shout about it unless you're prepared to serve the vision of someone else. That's the way it works. As we're faithful, God gives us more. And so some of you are saying, I want to do this and I want to do that. But actually you won't humble yourself enough to serve somebody else first. That's the way we learn, isn't it? In humbling ourselves, serving somebody else's cause, serving somebody else's vision. Then God looks down on us and smiles and says, they're faithful, they're a good servant, I'll let them have some responsibility in this. Parable of the talents, you've been faithful in a few things, see, I'll put you in charge of many things. 
So we need to serve and love each other. And Paul is asking the church to model itself on Christ. Now that sounds really strange that he should even have to ask that question of them and to, to even prompt, prompt them to even think about modeling themselves on Jesus. Isn't that something that we should just automatically do? Should we be Christ-like in all that we do and say? Should we live out our lives the way that Jesus lived out his? Should we give, you know, um, utmost uh, concentration to the scriptures and find out how Jesus lived and how Jesus walked and, and then implement it in our lives? Well, you'd have thought so, wouldn't you? But he's encouraging this church here to get that mindset. So if you haven't got that mindset today, get that mindset. I want to be like Jesus. I want to give birth to my calling and I want to humble myself and I want to serve other people. And I want the works of God to be done through me and in me. I want to be just like Jesus. Uh, I want to say a big and resounding amen to that in my own life this evening. And there's some words he uses to, to talk about that attitude. Let that same attitude be in you that was in Christ Jesus. Attitudes are something that we form and adopt. You can be a grumpy so-and-so and have a really nasty attitude. You can have an attitude of gratitude. But attitudes are something that we form and that we submit to. And so there's some big words here, and I just want to unpack them a little bit. And hopefully this will help us form the right attitudes to be Christ-like and to serve his call. We need to be humble. Now, Philippians tells us this, do not do anything out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather in humility, rather value others above yourselves. Not looking for your own interests, but each to the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset of Christ Jesus, who, being the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used for his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking on the nature of a servant, became in, light, in the human likeness, and found himself in appearance as a man. He humbled himself and became even obedient to death, even death on the cross. Jesus was humble. Humility is something that the church and Christians have kind of evaded in, in our generation. Uh, it's all about wanting to be somebody. I want to be Mr. Pastor Big. Uh, we want a big church. We want this. We want that. When you hear people start to speak a little bit like that in church, um, you will start to understand that they're just babies. If you've got a baby in a room of adults and a small baby, that baby will make more noise than all of those adults put together. The second he's hungry, you'll cry. The second he needs changing, he'll cry. The second he wants some sleep, he'll cry. And he'll cry, and he'll cry, and he'll cry until he gets his own way. Because that's just how babies are until they learn to articulate, ask, and then finally do stuff for themselves. My issue is not with Christians who are newly born of God. If you've only been saved a few months, then we, you know, we understand that you have not learned everything there is to do with a Christian life. My grace, uh, if I have one, is with Christians who have been saved 30 years. And still kept talking about wanting church their way. I want it this way. I don't like this. I don't like that. I don't want it this way. I don't like the music that loud. I don't like people wearing baseball caps. I don't. I don't. I don't. This is nothing to do with you. Show some humility. We're supposed to be serving the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and those people who he came and died for on Calvary. Let's have some humility about how we serve other people. So humility is key. Then gentleness, that's another attitude. I have a humble attitude, a attitude of a servant that it's not all about me, but it's all about God. Then I'm gentle. Now I've been in church long enough to know, and I can say some of these things because I'm 53 now, and there's not, nothing I have not seen in church. And, you know, we talk about gentleness. Sometimes church has been the, le the place where gentleness has been less demonstrated than anywhere else I've ever been. People have been dealt with in appalling fashion. They haven't been dealt with gently. People, I'll pull him down a peg or two. I'll tell the pastor this. I'll, I'll give them deacons what for. Who do they think they are telling me this? I'm not going to do that. You can hear the attitude, can't you? And we've heard it time and time again in church. I'm not pulling up with this. If they don't, well, I'll stop giving my money to this church and I'll find somewhere else to go. Hey, listen to me. If that's your attitude, give your money somewhere else and find somewhere else to go. Because we don't need that attitude in a changing community church. We need some humility and we need some gentleness. That doesn't mean to say that you can't say things. It doesn't mean to say that you can't confront people. 
but you can confront people without being confrontational. And you can challenge people without being challenging, if you know what I mean. It's having that attitude. This is an attitude thing now. Of course, arguments have to be settled. Yes, there is room for debate. I'm not saying close down everything and you don't have a say and, you know, if you don't like church, lump it. But what I'm saying is, if you love church and you love your pastor and you love your fellow believers, then show some gentleness in how you deal with things. You know, Jesus was never weak, never weak, but always meek. That rhymes, doesn't it? <laughs> he was never weak, but he was always meek. You know, there's a woman caught in adultery in the very act. You know, I don't really need to go into detail with that, but she was she was caught in bed with a man and um, in the very act. So they knew it was true. It wasn't hearsay. It wasn't that, that uh, somebody had said that they'd been doing some stuff that was wrong. They'd been caught out and, and they'd been caught in the very act. So she gets dragged in front of uh, the religious people. Now, where he is, I have no idea, which is, you know, I'll let you think about that one. But that boy got away with it. Maybe he was a Pharisee. Who knows? Perhaps they were just protecting their own. Just a little bit of a thought. Um, have a think about that um, as you're considering the scriptures. But she gets dragged in front of Jesus. Now, did he have the right to throw the book at her according to the law of God? Of course he did. Adultery was something that Moses had uh, written down from God, forbidding the people to get involved in those kind of relationships, saying they were wrong. You know, that you should have some faithfulness about yourself, that you, know, you don't go around sleeping with other people's partners. That's just not on. Um, something that we don't preach very hard in church, I know, but something that's absolutely true. We believe in sexual fidelity. We believe in stopping with your married partner and sorting things out, even if life becomes tough. I don't know why I'm saying that, but some of you perhaps need to hear that in Jesus' name. So he had the perfect right to, 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 to say, look, this is what the book says. This is what the scriptures said. You're in trouble here, Mrs. You need to sort yourself out. He had every right to point the accusing finger and rough her up, but he did not do that. He operated in grace. We do believe there's an accountability for sin. Of course we do. I'm not saying that he let her off lightly. But sometimes extending grace in that way is just the most amazing thing you could possibly ever do for somebody. The grace, I'm sure, corrected her. Because he said, look, does anyone condemn you? And they're all, they're all looking and they're frightened to say anything. They've all got away from the oldest to the youngest. The old boys cottoned on first. They knew what Jesus was doing. It took the to, to the young lads to walk away and then he said you know go and sin no more go and sin no more all right deal with the root of what's happened here you know don't rough her up he, he showed humility and kindness towards this girl extending grace towards her isn't that amazing isn't that amazing now don't shoot me down when i'm preaching really good but jesus got far more angry with the religious bigots than he did with people who committed adultery or people who committed murder and sin and all sorts of things because God expects more of his people and our attitudes have to be right and I'm expecting more of you as we go back to church I will challenge wrong attitudes I have no um, qualms about that at all over the last 12 months God's toughened me up in many ways and I want us to have a church that loves each other and serves God properly but if you have a wrong attitude it will be called out we need to have the same attitude that was in Christ Jesus hallelujah and then another attitude that was in Christ Jesus was patience patience we want people to change overnight when people get saved give their lives to Christ they are a work in progress uh, some things times we think that you know that then we flick a switch and everything changes well, the truth is, if you're in Christ, you are a new creation, but you have to learn to grow and you have to have your mind renewed by the Holy Spirit and his word as well. My dad used to give a, a lovely little example of people that are saved. He said, you know, uh, during the winter time, um, the, the, the tree still has some leaves on it that have not fallen off during the autumn and the winds are blown and whatever. But as spring arises, when a new season starts, the sap rises in the tree and the first thing it does before it puts new leaves on it, it pushes off the old ones. And so we have to allow the Spirit of God to rise in people's lives and to change them and to give them a 
new start and it might take some time and, and people want that overnight now I've told you many many times before I'm your pastor I'm not Mary Poppins I just can't click my fingers and make things happen but what I have learned and um, several of us in, in the lads group who took to mentoring and training and helping others over this pandemic time have learned this as well it's become really precious to me what I'm going to tell you now is that we don't berate people we don't kick them what we do do is we share God's word we pray and we love them and when we repeat it again <laughs> we share God's word we pray we love them we share God's word we pray we love them and we allow the Holy Spirit to change them to correct their thinking now sometimes we challenge them from God's word if something's seriously wrong of course we do but what I'm saying is we're not God and we can't change people but his word, our encouragement, prayer and loving people will make a significant difference in the relationships you find yourself in. So if you're struggling with somebody, pray, share the word, encourage, love, pray, share the word, encourage and love until the thing changes. Let the Holy Spirit work through you to minister to people. The scripture says that we need to bear one another in love. At times you have to be patient with people. They're not everything they could be. Not everything that we want them to be. But neither are we when you look at your own life. How, how, how much have we changed since we've come to know Christ? And he's changed us from the inside out. And the Bible says that we're changing from one level of glory to another level of glory. Sometimes I don't feel like I've got any glory in me. But I'm encouraged by the Bible that says that I am becoming more like Jesus. Hallelujah. Scripture says make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Make every effort to keep the unity. United we stand, as the saying goes, and divided we fall, and that's absolutely true. And we have to contend for unity, like these attitudes we've just been talking about. You can't switch them on and, and switch them off. There's something that we cultivate and practice and get wrong sometimes and ask for forgiveness and try again so start creating these attitudes in your heart but especially about the, this whole thing about keeping the unity through the bond of peace live peacefully with people you know there's no value whatsoever in rowing and cursing and, and getting upset with people and blowing your stack and people say well i couldn't help it i just got angry well you could help it and you can, not, you can live without anger and rage. People like Jesus he had every reason. He could have called a myriad of angels to kick the devil's backside and take him off the cross. And yet he hung there in humility and shame for me and for you. That's the same attitude that he wants us to cultivate. Paul says, that same attitude. That same humility, that same, you know, just forgiving heart and full of grace. That's what God wants us to be like. Be just like Jesus. Hallelujah. The New Living Translation says, Make every effort to keep yourself united in the Spirit. Binding yourselves together with peace. I like that. Binding yourselves together with peace. As a priority, we need to keep united. As a church, we need to keep united. This pandemic has been uh, quite interesting in terms, I think, that there's a sense of unity in church that wasn't there before. That people have had to make the effort to reach out to each other and to love each other and to continue to keep that relationship going. And so I, I think when we do get back, there'll be a whole sense of more of purpose between us and certainly encouraging people more and more to love Jesus. So it's not just the pastor or the leaders that are in, encouraging, but everybody's encouraging each other, which is what we need to do. And to be committed to the cause of Christ and to model out proper relationships. When people come in from the outside world, the Bible says, by this when all men know that you're my disciples, that you've got incredible Bible knowledge. He didn't say that, did he? By this will all men know you're my disciples, because you're worshipped wild and you jump up and down. He didn't say that, did he? By this will all men know that you're really spiritual, because you lay hands on the sick and they recover. No. By this will all men know you're my disciples, because you love each other. We want the supernatural. We want the power gifts, we want the anointing, we want the blessing of God. But none of that is worth tuppence if we can't love each other. The Apostle lists a whole list of spiritual gifts. 
And he says, you know, you can speak in tongues. You can be spiritual. You can prophesy. You can do all of these things. But if you've got no love, you're just like a clanging old cymbal. There's nothing worse than a clanging old cymbal, I can tell you. You know, um, I used to play the drums a little bit younger. Some of you remember that, some of you don't. Um, but, you know, there's nothing like a great, a new cymbal, a new crash cymbal, beautiful sound. But an old one that's bent out of shape and kind of just tinny. When you give that a strike, it's enough to set your teeth on edge and put your fingers in your ears. Well, that's what the Bible says. If you've got no love, then you're just like one of those old tinkling cymbals. You're just a noise, and not even a good noise, you're an offensive noise. So I'm encouraging you to love people. So the, uh, this attitude that was in Christ. He, di he didn't see some equality with God, something to be, to be grasped, the scripture said. Or to be used for his own advantage. He, he believed his connection with the Father was to minister to other people and to love them and to share the goodness of, of God with those around and about him. And that should be our attitude as well. Some, you know, some of us have lived in a way that it's almost we could have been led to believe that church was all about us, all about what we want, all about what we need. And then when we don't get it, our rattle goes out the pram and off we go to another church to annoy another pastor. Who then there's repeated behaviour and another rattle goes out the pram and so on and so forth. So, you know, maybe if you'd been like that, perhaps it's time for an attitude change, an attitude check. Just take the scriptures from Ephesians, read them again. See what God wants to do in you. Our oh, church could be so much a better place. It should be the most wonderful place on God's earth. We're in training for heaven. Not in training to blow each other's kneecaps off. The amount of nasty words, fights and stuff that I've seen in my lifetime as a Christian could actually have caused me to walk away at many, many points. But I'm telling you, I want to build a better day. And as, as we open up uh, after these pandemic months, I want us to have a church that's on fire for Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, but more so that we have love for each other. And he goes on to talk about that there is one body and one spirit, just as you've been called to one hope when you were called. Let's remember that the church is about Jesus and about him. It's his body, not ours. It might be chunked up into denominations. There might be various church names on various doors. But actually, we belong to the body of Christ, not because of our denominational tag or the fact that we've got a membership card. We belong to the body of Jesus Christ because we've been washed in his precious blood and sealed by his Holy Spirit until that day when he will ransom us and take us home to be with himself. So until those moments happen, we just keep on loving him and trusting him. But you are part of the church if you know Jesus as your Lord and Saviour. People say to me, why don't we have a membership in our church? Why don't we have a card in our church? Well, actually, you can have a card and not belong. But you belong because, one, you've been washed in the precious blood of Jesus. And two... God has brought you to Sedgley Community Church and planted you there. And if he's planted you there, you'll grow and you'll flourish. Now, if you've come to our church and you're not growing and flourishing, can I just tell you, go and find somewhere where you can be planted and grow and flourish. We will cheer you on and we will clap you out because we want you to grow in God. If you can't find it in your heart to be with us and love us and to serve God with us, then there are many other churches who will happily welcome you. I don't say these things because I'm a nasty pastor. I say them because I love you. I'd rather you be somewhere you're growing than somewhere that you're not. So we need to find the place, don't we? And this place essentially is my place. And for many of you, it's your place as well. So put a little thumbs up on whatever you do on Facebook when you hear this. If this place is your place, then give us a shout out. Steve, this place is my place. And I want to serve God. And I want to have that attitude that was in Jesus. Hallelujah. One hope. We have one hope. We've been talking about it over these last few weeks. God has given us an incredible hope. The hope is this, that Jesus Christ one day will see the travail of his soul and be satisfied that the harvest will be brought in. And as the old song says, we will come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves. Bringing in the sheaves. We will come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves. We have a hope that is steadfast and certain that one day that Jesus is coming back for his bride, who he has purchased with his own precious blood. We have a hope that is steadfast and certain. We have seen God through the curtain, touching the throne. We have a priest who is there interceding, pouring his grace still pouring his grace on our lives day by day. Hallelujah, we have this hope. Scripture tells us this, for this purpose was the Son of God manifest, to destroy all the works of the evil one. Jesus' saving work on Calvary is our glorious hope, and that's why we preach it week by week. 
And as, as you started to notice, we've started to make more gospel appeals than probably we've ever done in the history of our church. Because we want to give people opportunity to respond to the wonderful gift of God's love in Jesus on Calvary. Hallelujah. And so if you don't know Jesus tonight, I'll give that a chance again. Come to Christ. Get on your knees. Ask him to forgive you. He'll enter your soul and you'll be transformed from darkness to light. Your name will be written in the Lamb's Book of Life. You will be counted among the number of those that no man can number that, that have followed Jesus and love him and are part of his kingdom and his family. Bless the Lord. Hallelujah. Scripture says there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. There is no great areas in our church. Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. We are followers of Jesus Christ. We believe in his word. We believe it to be true and infallible. We believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. But the centrality of the cross and the blood of Jesus is what we pin everything on. Without Christ, we are lost and have no hope. With him, we have all hope in this world. One Lord, one faith, one baptism who is over all and through all and in all we serve a victorious saviour as well god is going to sum all of this up and let me read this scripture to you of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end and the scripture also says the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our god and of his christ and he will reign forever the Bible says that one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is truly Lord to the glory of God the Father. How complicated have we made it? A Paul from his prison cell is just imploring the church. He's on his knees and he's crying to God for them and he's encouraged them through his letter. Be like Jesus. Have an attitude like Jesus has got. Show some grace, some humility. Be humble. Serve people. Serve the Father. And in doing that, we can be at peace and know that we are in the greatest thing this world has ever seen. The body of Christ. That we're connected to Jesus. And we belong to him. What an amazing hope we have. So let me encourage you, if you need an attitude overhaul, then get it done. We have not got time in these next months and years that are in front of us to play games anymore. There's been a lot of politics played in church. I've got no time for that. There's a lot of been spiritual manipulation played in church, and I've got no time for that either. Don't you come up to me and stop playing your God card and telling me God told you this and God told you that. Especially if your attitude stinks. Or that you just want things your way. Just be very careful when you use the name of Jesus. You know, for me, I've said this to you before, that blasphemy is using God's name in vain. And we thought that as non-Christians using his name as a swear word. But I felt it's important for me to spell it out again in words that you cannot fail to understand. That when you start to say God said this, and you're using that to manipulate people in church or situations, you're blasphemy. That's blasphemy, that is. And you need to check your spirit. If you've ever done it, ask God to forgive you. Because it's not something that I want to stand before God and, and say, well, God, it's all right, but I did use your name in vain a few times. I did manipulate a few circumstances and situations. No, my prayer tonight, dear brothers and sisters in Sedgley, is that our attitude would like be that of Jesus. He never manipulated anybody. He never stood up and shouted and threw his rattle out the pram. He never made a scene or a fuss. He just loved God and loved his disciples. And he ministered to people. And he went from one place of prayer to another place of prayer. In the, in the meantime, he worked the most fantastic miracles and demonstrated what the kingdom of God is all about. That's the kind of life I want to live. That's the kind of Christian I want to become. That's the kind of church that I want to belong to. And by God's grace and mercy, that's where we're headed. As we take our focus, we focus ourselves on Jesus and the harvest. And that's all where we're going to our church.
in these next months and years. We want to serve Jesus and bring in the harvest together, loving each other, shouldering each other's burdens when the going gets tough, making sure everybody's looked after, making sure everybody gets a rest and that people are not just run ragged. That's another problem in church, and now I'm on a bit of a, bit of a soapbox giving it a rant, really, is that in church mostly that we have a small percentage of people that do everything, and a whole group of people that just love to talk about the people that do everything. Um, listen, we need to give each other space and rest. Again, that's something we've learned during this pandemic, that we don't have to keep running around like idiots. There are ways and means of meeting together, online as well, as, as together in person. And that's why some of the online stuff will definitely stop, that we can grab the people on the prayer Zoom and pray instantly for stuff in a matter of seconds and just get everybody connected, rather than people having to tra travel to buildings on dark winter nights and, 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 and odd times. There's all sorts of things that we can do together. And I, I take that as a personal challenge to create some of those spaces for us. But we need to keep on fighting shoulder to shoulder, and we're going to see the kingdom come, I believe, with all my heart. So thank you for dipping into the word with me. I've gone off on a little bit of a tangent tonight. I've got some notes. Quite clearly, you've seen that I'm not looked down very often. So something of the Spirit of God has overtaken me. And I believe I've communicated some stuff that some of you need to hear. And um, don't, don't think it was for somebody else. Because we have a tendency to believe when, you know, we've heard a, a stiff message. Oh, good. I hope so-and-so was listening to that. No, no, let my attitude be that of Christ Jesus. That I'm not kind of trying to make myself any better than I am. But my attitude is just like Jesus is, loving, caring and sharing the heart of the Father in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's pray. If I've offended you, then be offended because it's the word of God and, you know, the truth always in the end will set you free. So please take the word as it was meant and let it dwell in you richly and change your thinking and recalibrate our attitudes. Father, I just want to thank you for your word again this evening. It's a pleasure to just speak your word, to teach your word, to share your goodness with the family here in Sedgley. I just pray an incredible blessing upon our lives as we march towards Easter. Can't believe the time has gone already and Christmas is over and Easter's on us now. But Lord, I just pray that you just continue to bless us. Pour out your spirit upon us. Save our family members. Save those that so desperately need you. And I pray right now that you would go with us and be with us in your mighty and precious name. Amen. Good night and God bless you. Think upon the word of God and let it change you. Let your attitude be altered forever as we just seek to do what God wants us to do in his precious name. Amen.